Good morning. It is so good to have each of you here with us this morning as we continue in our study in the book of Mark. So if you have your Bible with you this morning, uh, pick it up and open it up to Mark chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse number 14 in just a few moments. But first, we want to open with the word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we praise your name. We thank you, Lord, for this book of Mark that you've given us, Lord, as we open it this morning. We ask, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would you would guide us in this study this morning as we open your word. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your life that you live for us, uh, the only sinless life that's ever been lived on this earth by a human being. Lord Jesus, you set a perfect example for us in how we should live our lives. And Lord, as we go through this study today, Lord, help us to see specifically the ways that you showed us and how you would have us to live and that we each one would model these perfect examples that you have set and how we should regard ourselves and as we should regard other people, Lord, in our, in our relationship with you, Lord God, in each and every day, in each and every way that we live our lives. Lord, guide our hearts now. It's in Jesus' great name that we pray. Amen. Jesus approached his earthly ministry with a missionary mentality. He never asked for money and never expected any kind of a reward for what he said or what he did. He simply demonstrated compassion to people who needed it. As a result, people flocked to him. He, they recognized genuine love when they saw it. They saw something in Jesus that they weren't seeing in the religious leaders of their day. And they responded by wanting to know more about Jesus. Let's go down now to Mark 14. I mean, I'm sorry, Mark 1, verse 14. And let's read there verses 14 and 15. Now, after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the gospel of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, this John that's mentioned here is John the Baptist. John the Baptist continued his preaching at the coming of the Messiah into the world for another several months before he was taken into custody by Herod Antipas. Galilee was a small, out-of-the-way district in northern Israel that had never been proclaimed or prominent in the Old Testament times. Yet, this was the area Jesus was most familiar with since he had grown up there. Preaching, as is translated in the New American Standard, or proclaiming, if you happen to have a Christian Standard Bible, was not necessarily a religious term, as, as we see in this these two verses. It had to do with announcing information out loud as a herald might deliver a vital proclamation from a king. Now, Jesus knew that his calling by the Holy Spirit was to bring the good news of salvation from sin. The Greek word, as we looked at last week, evangelion, which is traditionally translated gospel, means good news. Also, we see this phrase, the time is fulfilled, 
means that centuries of waiting were over. The Greek word translated time refers not to chronological time, but to a season or an era of time. Fulfilled is a reference to the scriptural prophecies of the coming of the Messiah. Specifically written in 700 BC is a prophecy that we find in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah that is particularly pertinent here where it says that Jesus came into Galilee with the very first parts of his ministry. In Isaiah 9, we read in Isaiah but there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. These are two of the tribes of the original tribes of Israel with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. The kingdom of God is at hand, there in those verses, refers to God's rule through his designated eternal king, the Messiah. Because the Messiah had arrived now, in the book of Mark, he was on the move, and his kingdom was beginning to be established through the good news called the gospel. Now, we come down further in Isaiah chapter 9, where we read the confirmation of this. For a child will be born to us. This child was the child Jesus. A son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Now, Jesus comes on this earth, and he comes into this area of Galilee, and he says, repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the good news, the greatest news that mankind has ever heard the kingdom of God. It's the response that God requires for forgiveness of sins and eternal entry into his eternal kingdom. The gospel or good news is the content that is to be believed, personally relying upon absolute truth for salvation and entry into his kingdom. At the same time, Jesus Christ is the person in whom every person is to trust by faith. Then following the Lord Jesus Christ in faith day by day throughout the remainder of our lives and for all of eternity. Now let's come down to verses 16 through 18. As he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. The Sea of Galilee was a freshwater inland lake about 14 miles long and six miles wide. In the Old Testament, the Sea of Galilee was called Sea of Kinnereth. Okay. In the New Testament, the Sea of Galilee is called 
by a couple of names, the Sea of Gennesaret or the Sea of Tiberias. It was renamed under the Roman Empire. Okay, Simon and Andrew operated a commercial fishing business on the lake. They are the sons of a man named Jonah. That's their father's name. Jesus dubbed Simon as Cephas, or it, that's the Aramaic, his Aramaic name, or Peter, as it is his Greek name. Both of those two names, Cephas and Peter, mean rock. Okay. Simon later wrote, will write the letter, letters of 1 Peter and 2 Peter. As we learned earlier, that this book of Mark may well be Simon Peter's memoirs of the, of the life and ministry of Jesus. Jesus issued an invitation to Simon and to his brother, Andrew, follow me. Okay, they're out fishing, and he says, come and follow me. Come on. And, and they recognize that he's the Messiah. They probably heard about him already. And as far as we know, they did. And he says, and I will make you become fishers of men, a powerful image for the role these men had in preaching and leading others to follow Jesus as well, to make them fishers of men. Okay. Now I'm going backwards here. Let's get going the right direction. Okay, verses 19 and 20 in our text. I'm thinking on the right page. Pages are sticking together a little bit. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat and hired and the hired servants and went away to follow him. James and John also operated a commercial fishing business along with their father Zebedee. Okay. James would later become the first of the original 12 disciples to be martyred for his faith in Jesus. John, his brother, would be the longest lived of the 12 disciples, living to be over 90 years old, and would, would also be the one of the 12 to die, the only one of the 12 to die of natural causes. His father is Zebedee, of course. He is not going to be a follower of Jesus. He stayed behind to run the business when, when James and John went to follow Jesus. Okay, in each case, these men immediately walked away from their lifelong professions to answer their calling from Christ Jesus to follow me. They, they felt the conviction to do so, and they answered that call from God. Okay, now let's come down to verses 21 and 22. They went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and began to teach. They were amazed at Jesus's teaching, and he was teaching them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Jesus astonished those who heard him because he did not recite the ancient rabbis as did the scribes, but provided his own interpretations of the scripture. Jesus demonstrated his own authority to speak his own opinion as the truth on any subject. And the people were amazed by his own original words. We see this also after he speaks his, his, uh, his Sermon on the Mount. They, they talk about his amazing authority to speak the words of God. Now we come down to verse 23 and 24. Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out saying, what business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now, a man possessed and controlled by an, a demonic 
spirit, an unclean spirit, recognized Jesus as the Son of God, calling him by a messianic title well known by first century Jewish rabbis. He called him the Holy One of God. Now, I'm going to explain quickly to you why this was so well known, okay? But first of all, it's found in Psalm 2, 1 through 12, where the Holy One of God is equated to the Messiah. That is a messianic name that's used in Psalm 2. And also, this name is equated to the Son of God. Okay, then in Psalm 16, the Holy One of God is prophesied to be raised from the dead. Okay, then in, in Isaiah 43, the Holy One of God is again specified as the Messiah, but he is called also the Savior and the Redeemer, and is equated with Yahweh, the great I Am. So this has got, this name has powerful implications, and understanding it as a messianic name. And this demonic figure calls Jesus by that name. Okay, he is an unclean spirit, and he asked, have you come to destroy us? The demons spoke through the man, saying, what business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? The demonic are respectful, but at the same time fearful of Jesus, because they know who he really is. They also know that their ultimate destiny is eternal confinement and destruction to be cast into hell at the final judgment day. Now, Jesus says of Satan later that he has already been judged, as have all of his followers, the demonic. They have already been judged. Their fate is already determined. Ours has not been determined. Our fate is yet to be determined on the judgment day based on our decision on how we accept or reject Jesus as the Messiah, how we accept or reject the gospel, the good news about Jesus. Okay, Those of the spiritual realm recognize the authority authority of Jesus, however, they know he is the son of God. They've seen him set at the right hand of God in heaven. They know that there will come a day when Jesus will judge everyone and the spiritually unclean will be destroyed. We'll see this spoken. We see this spoken of again in John chapter five by Jesus himself. Now let's come down to verses 25 and 26. And Jesus rebuked this spirit saying, not because what he said was false, but for another reason. He says, be quiet, come out of him, throwing him into convulsions. The unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. Jesus rebuked the demonic spirit and told him, be quiet. And we see through, as we see throughout the gospels, Jesus sought to conceal his full idea, identity until the appropriate time according to his father's plan. Okay, the people, the people were not ready to hear this full story just yet. That's the reason John chapter five, way later in his ministry, he will come to reveal this whole picture in John chapters five, six, seven, eight, and nine. He will come to reveal this completely and more and fully to the Jewish religious leaders in Jerusalem, in the temple, okay? And, and so 
Also, Jesus was careful not to identify with the popular but incorrect messianic expectations of his day. Most people wanted a powerful, worldly king who would overthrow Rome and free them from their oppression. So if they thought Jesus was that powerful, they were going to want him to become king immediately and to overthrow Rome and establish his 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 kingdom there on earth okay and it wasn't time for that discussion to come into play at all okay now we come down to verses 27 and 28 they were all amazed so that they debated among themselves saying what is this a new teaching with authority he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him Immediately, the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding district of Galilee. Now let's come down to verses 29 through 34. In verse 29, we read, And immediately after they came out of the synagogue, they went to the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Okay. In verses 29 through 31, they went to Simon and Andrew's house where Jesus healed Simon's mother-in-law. She apparently was very, very sick. She didn't just have a cold. She was very ill and Jesus healed her. Now in verses 32 through 33, when darkness signaled the close of the Sabbath, that means meant the Sabbath was over, the whole city then was able to come out again, and they brought sick and demon-possessed individuals to the house of, of Simon and Andrew, where Jesus was staying, and he healed many, possibly well into the night. Okay. In verse 34, Jesus also cast out many demons, but was not permitted, not permitting the demons to speak because they knew who he really was. See, is with this last demon, there wasn't a big crowd around, but now there was. And so Jesus was not allowing them to, the demon to say to speak at all. Probably that first demon was allowed to speak a little bit for the benefit of Jesus's new disciples so they could come to a little bit better understanding of who he was. Uh, they did need to know some of these things early apparently okay so we come down to verse 35 in the early morning while it was still dark jesus got up left the house and went away to a secluded place and was praying there mark emphasizes that jesus rose early in the morning that probably was his custom and while it was still dark he went outside he went away to a secluded place where he could be alone for a extended period of time for personal prayer. Now, the question is, why did Jesus do this? Jesus, though fully God, was also fully human, okay? He was he was doing life just like you and I do life, okay? We already saw that he was tempted to sin by the evil one, just like we are tempted to sin like the evil one. Okay, yet he was tempted without sinning, which we have already failed at. Okay, he had a perfect sinless relationship with his father. So he becomes a perfect example of how to live life. It's good for us to see how he lived so that we can see how to make our life better. Okay. He exercised through prayer in the same way that we should also. A quality relationship with God that can only flourish when a person is regularly, or what I mean is regularly daily, at least daily, probably multiple times during the day, conversing with God in prayer. The key is being intentional to make time to be alone with God in prayer every day, just like Jesus did 
every morning. Okay, now we do see sometimes later in the Gospels when he's getting closer to the end of his ministries and, and, and close to the end of ministry segments that he will also take time away in the evening. Okay, so because something big is coming up and he needs to talk to his father again a second time in more detail about something specific. Okay, now we'll come down to verses 35 through 37. Simon and his companions searched for him and they found him and he and said to him, everyone is looking for you. Like, where did where in the world did you run off to? There's a lot of people here wanting you. Okay, verse 38 through 39, he said to them, let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also for that is what I came for. And he went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out demons. Throughout all Galilee is key phrase. It's underlined there. Jesus' answer to his disciples, let us go somewhere else, does not reveal a personal desire to escape the crowd. Rather, his answer reveals God's direction for the day given to him during this time of prayer that he just had. That is what I came for. In his time of prayer, the father reinforced to Jesus his personal calling. Then Jesus did exactly what his father had commanded him to do in his time, in his prayer time. He went into their synagogues throughout all of Galilee, preaching and casting out demons. God does the same thing for each one of us who believes in Jesus. He uses our times of prayer and meditation to get us out of ruts, out of spiritual ruts where we may be stuck seeking personal desires. We may have found a place we like and we want to just stay here for a while. And God may say, it's time to move on past this and go to another place. Okay. And we find that out during prayer. Okay. Now let's come down to verse 40. And a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him and falling on his knees and saying, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, we don't hear as much about lepers nowadays, but according to the World Health Organization, leprosy still affects more than two hundred thousand people today worldwide but it can be treated nowadays and most people are able to live normal lives who have leprosy it's still not very much curable okay you kind of have it all your life but you can treat it and hold down its effects in the ancient world in the first century a.d it was absolutely feared, it was contagious, and it was dreadful to have. It led to death, and you could give it to other people, and they too would die. Okay, The biblical term leopard could have described a person with any number of similar diseases, but true leprosy affected every part of the body and was terminal. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. In worst cases, it would slowly eat away and rot the body, leaving its victim under a guaranteed death sentence. We know from the Old Testament that lepers were legally forbidden from social interactions placed in leper colonies outside the cities and left to die. The priests were trained in how to examine a person, determine if he or she had leprosy, and authorized to pronounce that a person be quarantined. It, it was, most of the time, it was incurable, okay? Occasionally, people would get over it. Now, what we're finding out today is they probably didn't have really have leprosy. They had something that looked like leprosy, and it was something that went away. It still does today. These things that look like leprosy will 
your body is able to fight it off. But if you've had true, if you have true leprosy, even today, it's, it's really, if you don't get some really, really strong treatment for it, it you're going to, you're going to have it your whole life. You won't be able to get rid of it yourself. Okay. Lepers therefore were required to dress like people in mourning, wearing a torn, torn club clothing and a face covering. They were not allowed to keep their hair clean because they were considered the equivalent of walking dead. Whenever other people approached them, lepers were required to shout out that they were unclean so that so those people could avoid them. This leopard came to Jesus and he had in doing that, coming near Jesus like this, he had broken the law in, in, in coming this close to Jesus. He was desperate. And he really had nothing more to lose in doing so. He had heard about Jesus and his boldness was measured with humility, we see, as he as he begged Jesus. He was beseeching Jesus, falling on his knees before Jesus. Okay. The word begged is used in place of beseeching in, in the, the Christian standard Bible, okay? The leper's initial request of Jesus was, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, let's, let's analyze those words a little bit. If you are willing, although the leper was desperate, he was respectful of Jesus. He did not make a demand of Jesus, but made a personal and sincere request of him. It also shows the leper's willingness to submit to the desires of Jesus. But when he attaches the second phrase, you can make me clean, coupled with the first of the leper's statement, this is a statement of faith. He believes that Jesus can heal him of this of this incurable disease that he has, which is leprosy. <clears throat> and he, call, he calls it, he doesn't say heal me. He says, make me clean. Now, what he means by that is he knows the Jewish law. That, that means he knows the written scriptures in the biblical law of the Old Testament. And he knows that what the process he has to go through when he thinks that he is cured of leprosy, he has to go before a priest who will examine him. And that priest will have him go through some cleansing processes. And if he goes through those and passes all of that process of tests, then he will be declared clean. And then he can go back to see his family he can go back into society. He can go back and see his neighbors. He can go back and get involved in, in all the things that he used to get involved in. And he can come back into the temple and he can worship God like he's supposed to worship God according to God's law. Okay. The man wanted to be made clean or cured of his leprosy and he wanted to do he wanted to do it right so that he could get reintegrated into society as well because he wanted to probably get back with his family as well okay now hearing all this that he wanted to do he wanted to do it all and do it right okay he didn't want to just be cured so he could go back home he wanted to do everything and do it right and and jesus hearing this he was moved with compassion and Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Though Matthew and Luke both relate this story, the same story, Mark is the only gospel writer who records that Jesus was moved with compassion by what the leper had said. When people in the first century saw a leper, they would normally... They would normally avoid them at all costs. They would run the other way. Their appearance alone, especially for someone in advanced stages of the disease, was absolutely 
repulsive and terrible. Jesus stretched out, however, stretched out his hand to the man. Someone touching a leopard was strictly forbidden by the old covenant law and would have made even Jesus ceremonially unclean. However, Jesus was so moved by the leper's faith and his request that he chose to personally touch the man and bring healing to him through that touch of his hand. Jesus could have healed the man in any number of ways, but Jesus chose to show his genuine love and compassion toward him, showing that he cared enough that he was willing to touch the man, disregarding rituals and regulations. Jesus said to him, I am willing. I am willing to be cleansed. Once again, Jesus demonstrated his power over disease, even the most feared disease of their time. When any one of us comes to our Lord Jesus, trusting in him to help us, he hears our requests, and he moves to meet our needs. While God is, God's timing may not always align with our personal agendas, he, we never have a question about his willingness to work in our lives, to bring good from even the worst possible scenarios. Our Lord Jesus listens to and he answers every single prayer that one of his children brings to him. In verse 42, it says, immediately the leprosy left him. Mark's emphasis here was on the timing. You see, he uses that word immediately again. Let me get myself on it here. Okay. Um, I did. I was on it. Okay, it's, it's right there in verse 42. Notice, immediately the leprosy left him. He was cleansed. Mark uses that word immediately a lot. With, with God, all things are possible, and they're immediately possible. Okay, and he was immediately cleansed. Jesus made the man ceremonially cleansed in the eyes of the Mosaic law as well. He was healed, and he was cleansed. Though it was obvious by observation that the man was healed, he would need to show himself to the priest to be re readmitted in, into the first century Jewish religious and social law. He was cleansed indicates a double meaning. Also, Jesus had made the man ceremonial clean by the Mosaic law, and he, because of his faith, because of his faith, and don't miss this, because of his faith, Jesus had forgiven the man of his sin debt as well. His heart was cleansed of the disease of sin. And so now the man felt so very good, not only about this amazing cleansing of his body, something that everybody thought was impossible and would never happen to him. They thought, why bother going and talking to Jesus? Everybody knows that leprosy is incurable. Everybody who gets it dies. As it says in Isaiah 118, Isaiah says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they may be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. And now this man was forgiven of his sins because of his faith in Jesus. So now let's look what happens next. And Jesus sternly warned him and immediately sent him away. And he said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Okay. There are two verbs in this context of verse 43. One about warning, he was warning the man, 
and one about sending, and, and he was sending the man. Both give us the hint that Jesus was quite serious to the man about not telling anyone about his healing, but yet sending him out into the world to tell people about Jesus. Okay, he, he was telling him to do both things, and is very serious about both things. Okay, the man was just to show himself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony. Now, why did Jesus tell him not to say anything about his healing? That was remarkable. That was wonderful. That was a great testimony, you would think, about what Jesus could do. But the greater testimony was about what Jesus did to him as far as his sins. Okay, verse 44. Too much misunderstanding about the Messiah's mission already existed in the area. Too many people were coming to Jesus just to be healed of physical ailments. Too many. They were getting healed and they were walking away. And nothing more happened to them than to be healed physically. But this man also was healed spiritually. Jesus was focusing on his message of redemption from sin and his work to bring the good news of salvation to everyone. More publicity about his healing miracles would only bring more insincere people to Jesus, wanting him to do things for worldly reasons, even to the point where they might want to make him a worldly king. So Jesus asked the healed man, excuse me, to say nothing to anyone about the healing. Jesus was emphasizing that his mission was not just to heal people physically, but Jesus commanded the man to do the things related by, required by the Jewish law. Okay, go do what you legally need to do according to the law in order to have the, his relationships restored with other people to go back home to be with his family to do his family life to be allowed to enter the temple to properly worship god to go back into society to legally do the things in society that he needed to do such as such actions by the man would give others a proper testimony of the way he lived his life Okay, they should see a changed man. The believer's personal testimony to God of God's work in his life is an important tool for God's use in his life. To keep our personal testimony in good shape, the believer must, number one, be faithful to Christ's commands through prayer and study of scripture okay pray to god know his word okay in in his word was the torah the the law it said what to do if you're cured of leprosy jesus said go do that yes do that you need to do that okay number two Obeying the laws of the land as far as they comply with God's written word. Okay, what should he do in society then? Well, he should do what society says. Once you've been cleared by the, the, the priest first, then you can come back into society and do everything that you did before legally. Okay, and, and Jesus says, do that. But don't tell anybody about the healing. We don't need that right now. That's not God's will at the present time. Okay. Now, in four, verse 45, but he, what did he really do? But he went out and he began to proclaim it freely and spread the news around, the news of his healing, to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city, but stayed out of in unpopulated areas, and they were coming to him from everywhere. But the former leper went out and he began to proclaim it, the, his healing freely 
and to spread the news around about it. The Greek word for proclaim can also be translated preached. While the man had good intentions in, in telling everyone what had happened and, 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 and who had healed him, it would ultimately present a, a big challenge to Jesus and his ministry. Jesus could no longer enter a city, but had to go to unpopulated areas due to large, unbelievably large crowds in the city. But even in outside of the cities, the crowds still managed to find him. And they would come from everywhere and see and hear him. Bible scholars often refer to Jesus's desire for silence in cases like this as the messianic secret. Okay, God the Father knew what would happen if this, if everybody just got focused on physical stuff. What would happen on earth? Earthly things. God was trying to get people to focus on the spiritual, eternal things. Things that would last forever, like our salvation and our entry into the eternal kingdom of God and what God wants us to do in preparation for that great judgment day is coming in the future for every single one of us when we will have to stand before God and give answer for what we did what we do about Jesus Christ what is our answer to Jesus in terms of our salvation that is what ultimately each one of us must do Okay, now let's come down to chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home, and many were gathered together so that there was no longer any room. See, Capernaum's a city, okay? Not even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them, okay? He still spoke the word, even though now he was even in his home and he could even get out the door possibly following jesus jesus's outright rejection by the people of his hometown nazareth as we see in luke 4 16 through 30 he and his disciples had made capernaum their new home base of their ministry operations in verse one the home where jesus stayed was while in Capernaum was probably that of Peter and Andrew. We see that told us in Matthew 4.13. Apparently, after moving their base of operations to Capernaum, Peter and Andrew and their family had moved there from Bethsaida. Bethsaida. Mark 1.29 and John 1.44. So we, we find all that information there. And that's consistent with the other Gospels. Verses 3 through 4, and they came bringing Jesus a paralytic carried by four men, being unable to get to him because of the crowd. Okay, so they're in Peter's home. Remember that in Capernaum. Uh, they couldn't get to him because of the crowd. They removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. Now, most houses in Palestine in the first century had an outside stairway leading to a thatched roof on the top. Making a hole in the roof would have been would not have been difficult. Uh, they could do that uh, it, fairly easily. It would also have been financially difficult and very discerning to the owners, very, very disconcerting to the owners. So they would have been very upset. Okay. The man on the pallet obviously believed Jesus could help him and spoke to his friends about taking him to Jesus. Uh, this was a desperate act. They couldn't get in the door because of all the people crammed up against the door. They wouldn't let them in. Okay, It involved the risk of rejection, possible remuneration, and maybe even physical violence. The man realized that Jesus was the only one who could help him, and he was willing to do almost anything to get in front of Jesus. Now we come to verse 5, and Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now this is interesting. He didn't say you're healed. He said your sins are forgiven. Jesus did not reprimand them for damaging Peter's house. Instead, he saw their faith. 
all healing comes from God. Okay. And faith was necessary for this man's healing. In Hebrews 11, 6, it says, And without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. If it weren't for the faith and the faithfulness of his friends, though, the disabled man could never have gotten to the house and could never have been brought before Jesus. In many cases, a, a disability or sickness is not a direct result of sin in that, in that person's life. But as we know sometimes, as in John 8, 11, the disability can be a direct result of personal sin. Jesus knew that the man had a deeper need than physical healing, as we all do. We each have a sin problem that results in our deaths, which only Jesus can heal. Now let's come down to verse 6. But some of the scribes were sitting there, scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their heads, why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? It's a good question. Scribes were legal experts in the scriptures, lawyers who would have come out of Jerusalem. This shows that by now the crowds Jesus was attracting were drawing a great interest from all the Jewish religious leaders. Pharisees had come from all over Galilee and Judea, we learned already. We, in Luke 5, 17, it says that specifically. Jesus was not a product of their schools. He was from the, a different culture. They were probably there to check out Jesus' teachings. They were reasoning in their hearts that Jesus, now they're reasoning that he was blasted. Okay, now this is a mixture of what they knew about Scripture plus what is in their oral traditions, which is man-made writings, okay? Man-made interpretations and extensions onto what Scripture says, okay? So they, they are thinking about those things, but they are missing just a couple of things. Forgiveness of sins is specifically said to be in Scripture, something that only God can do. But there are also scriptures that they are overlooking that says that the Messiah, when he comes, will be God in flesh and blood. And also, specifically, that the Messiah can heal and the Messiah can forgive sins also. Okay, they were overlooking those things. Okay, and, and many of their ancient interpreters overlook those things as well. Why? Because they wanted the Messiah to be an earthly king, not an eternal spiritual king, if you will. Okay, let's come down to verses 8 through 10. Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit, that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you re reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, get up and pick up your pallet and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Okay, now, one thing I, I notice here that Jesus used the term, he called himself the son of man. That's Jesus' favorite title in reference to himself in the Gospels. He uses it over 80 times of himself, okay? In the Old Testament prophecies, they call the Messiah the son of man all the time. Many of them, especially in Ezekiel and Daniel. The Messiah is the heavenly figure given 
the authority, glory, and sovereign power over the over an everlasting kingdom which shall never be destroyed in Daniel and also in Isaiah. Okay, Son of Man is a simultaneous reference to both Christ's human and divine nature. With Jesus, it wasn't just a question of saying the words, your sins are forgiven, or you are healed to him. It was a question of his authority over both. Are you seeing, are you following me? God is omniscient. He know, even knows the hearts of people. He was teaching a lesson to all the people there with that state. Now let's come down to the second half of verse 10 and let's follow on and see what happens so he said to the paralytic <clears throat> i say to you get up pick up your pallet and go home so far jesus issued the man three simple commands that would take faith for him to execute he said get up remember he's paralyzed or he was paralyzed. He says, pick up your pallet. People who have been paralyzed for a long period of time become severely atrophied or weak. Even if he could get, you know, manage to struggle to get to his feet, uh, if he, he would be very weak, difficult to pick up a heavy pallet. And then thirdly, go home. Every person inside that house and outside the house would have would see firsthand proof that Jesus exhibited the absolute God-given authority to heal. Like Jesus, our faith must go beyond words to include both acts of obedience to God through both spiritual and physical ministry to others who are in need. God can do all things. God touches all aspects of our lives. We need to teach ourselves as well as others that God is in charge of all things. There are not things we can hide from God. There are not things that we do for ourselves. There are all things, in all things, we entrust them to God and we do them according to God's will alone let's go to verse 12 and he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying god saying we have never seen anything like this again mark uses this word immediately see it right right here verse 12 to indicate a quick sequence of events. Although the crowd had not parted to allow the man to enter, remember they wouldn't let him into the room. But when Jesus says, pick up your pallet and walk, they were quick to jump up and see what happened. They quickly moved aside to see this miraculous healing demonstrated as that man picked up his pallet and walked out of that house. Verse 13, and when Jesus went out again by the seashore and all the people were coming to him and he was teaching them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. We know from Matthew's account that Levi is Matthew, Matthew 9, 9. Jesus chooses people from all works of life and all levels of society. Matthew, or Levi, was an educated white-collar worker. He was a tax collector, working the tax booth by the seashore. He would have been considered a, a traitor by the Jews because he worked for the Roman government at, at the expense of his own people. Jewish people considered tax collectors as the worst of sinners. Yet Jesus called Matthew to be one of his 12 disciples. 
He showed his faith by walking away. Look at, look at verses 15 and 16. It happened that he was reclining at the table in his house. And many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples. And there were many of them and they were following him. That's an interesting thing. When the scribes and the Pharisees saw that he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, he said to his disciples, why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? Not now. Not long after being called by Jesus, Matthew threw a party for his, at his house for his old friends so they could all meet Jesus. Probably a group of pretty Shady characters by the standards of the very religious and pious Pharisees who were peeking in the windows. The Pharisees, they were too pompous to be in there themselves. In the first century, they were well respected by the common people. And they wanted to know how this new and very popular rabbi, Jesus, could hang around with, with these kinds of people. And they were looking down their nose at him. And asking his disciples how could he hang around with tax collectors and sinners and hearing this Jesus said to them he turned his face and said to them it's not those who are well healthy who need a physician but those who are sick I did not come call righteous but sinners the Pharisees imagined their self-righteousness was enough to commend them to God but scripture consistently refutes that claim. Isaiah 64, 6, which they should have known, says, but we are all like an unclean thing. All our righteousness, righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away none of us can save ourselves with righteousness. Our spiritual cleanliness depends upon our faith in Jesus Christ alone. Faith in Jesus keeps us spiritually pure and clean in God's eyes. Following, following where he leads keeps our personal relationships with him strong. Verse 18. John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting and they came and said to him, why do John's disciples, now this is John the Baptist's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting and they say, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Well, Jesus answers in verse 20, but the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, then they will fast and do in that day, there was much for them to learn. There were just a few days by, in comparison for them to be trained in everything Jesus wanted. And he says, there's plenty of time for fasting later. Uh, right now, they're in training. Okay, verses 23 and 24 before this say, and it happened that he was passing through the grain fields and the Sabbath and his disciples began to take make their way along while plucking the heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? The Jewish old oral traditions in the first century included 39 activities or prohibited on the Sabbath. Among those were reaping, winnowing, threshing, and preparing a meal, all of which he, they saw that the disciples were doing that day. Even the walk that Jesus and the disciples were taking on that day was suspect. They wondered how Jesus could have been sent by God if he and his disciples were blatantly breaking those Sabbath rules. <coughs> by the way, those rules are not in the scriptures. Those were a part of their oral traditions that were added. Okay, They were not a part of the scriptures. What the scripture says is remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy okay verses 27 and 28 jesus said to them the sabbath was made for man and not man for the sabbath 
So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Who knows what is holy? Only God knows what is holy. People do not. God knows what his agenda is. God knows what needs to be done on a given day. God determines what is holy. Right? So God is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is the Son of God. Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He said, they're doing important things. Leave them alone. Okay? They're doing my will. Leave, it, leave them alone. Okay? Verses 1 and 2. Another time he went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for reasons to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. The Pharisees now were following Jesus and his disciples everywhere they went. They went into a local synagogue on the Sabbath. In verse 3, Jesus knew their hearts, so he said to the man with the, with the shriveled hand, stand up right in front of everybody in the synagogue. In verses 4 and 5, then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill. So they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed by their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and the hand was completely restored. Matthew states that Jesus cited scripture as a legal precedence. What man is there among you who has a sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out. How much more valuable then is a man than a sheep? So then, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? This is in Matthew 12, 11 through 12. Luke adds, but they themselves were filled with rage and discussed together what they might do to Jesus. Luke 6, 11. In verse 6, Mark writes, then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. They realized that he was he had an answer for everything. And that answer was, this is God's will. Let's pray. Father, we praise your name. We we hear these words, we understand the conflict between man and your work. Lord, for those of us who are doing your will, and at the times in our lives when we have been doing your will, Lord, we realize that when we are doing your will, evil men come against us. Evil women come against us. Evil people come against us. Lord, we know that that is what the evil one would, would have. He would stop your work. Lord, help us to do your will in all things. Help us to follow you at every moment, in every way. Lord, God, our hearts, Lord, is, as we take our walk, our lives with you, Lord, show us the ways that you would have us to go in each step of our lives. Lord, we ask that you be glorified in all that we do. Lord, help us to do your will. Speak to our hearts. Show us the steps that you would have us to take. Lord, we ask these things. Lord Jesus, in your great name. Amen. We'll see you guys next week. Same time. Pick up right here where we left off. Chapter 3. Bye-bye.